right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I am so thrilled to be with you here today because today marks day two of our three-day epic Nature for All Festival. I am the new Canadian coordinator of the Nature for All Global Nature Network, and I'm thrilled to bring some of the top people and organizations coast to coast to coast across Canada to you for this special series highlighting the amazing work of so many folks in Canada to make sure we all have access to the natural world, change our perspectives on, and have a natural world to protect for generations to come. For today's opening program, one of our, our four sessions today, we are joined by Dr. Boris Worm. He is going to talk to us today about exploring the oceans from your living room. He's a marine ecologist who works to connect people and ecosystems around the globe, one of the most distinguished scientists in Canada, and the founder of Ocean School, the world's most immersive virtual ocean experience. I've had the chance to see this in person. It's absolutely mind-blowing. I'm so excited you can join us today as Dr. Worm explains all the incredible work that he's done to make this possible. So without further ado, I'll stop talking and turn it over to Boris. Thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. <laughs> Hi, good morning everyone and glad you could join us this morning. Um, yeah, we're going to dive into the ocean today. Excuse my voice a little bit of just coming down with a cold, but um, <clears throat> I think we're still going to have fun. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the ocean and why it is important to learn about the ocean, uh, how the ocean affects us, but also what we do, how it affects the ocean in turn. Um, we're going to watch a couple of videos. I'm going to show you a few slides and tell you a little bit about um, how I got to be a marine biologist. So um, I'm going to share my slides now. Um, Jesse, does that look all right? Everyone, everybody can see the slides? Sorry, yes, I, I, I wasn't in. Yes, it's beautiful, you're good, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. So this is not me, this is a friend of mine called Brian Scary, and he, um, he is one of the world for, foremost uh, nature photographers, and he spent a lot of time underwater with, with marine animals. And um, he met this uh, endangered right whale in uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand, where he was diving to film them. And um, I was lucky enough to see a similar species here, right here in Canada in the Bay of Fundy. But as I was telling Jesse before our talk, um, the visibility there is so poor that you never see the entire whale. You see like the mouth and then you see the eye and then you see a flipper and then you see the tail, you see it in sections. And incredibly, we were able to capture that experience on 360 video and you can visit oceanschool.ca and you can have that experience for yourself. Um, diving uh, with the with the endangered northern right whale. So I want to start and and ask how do we learn to see the ocean? How do we individually and collectively see the ocean? What's uh, what's our connection to it? And we asked that question actually to kids all around the world for a video we did for the United Nations. And I just want to really share that short video with perspectives from kids all around the world. And here we go. Il recouvre presque les deux tiers de la surface de la Terre. Dahil hindi lang ito basta isang malaking anyong tubig, ngunit ito ang dugong buhay ng ating planeta. It's full of amazing creatures and organisms that we don't see anywhere else on our planet. The life of the human is dependent by the ocean. Ana, Kore kara mo zutto oishii sakana ga tabete ikeru yo ni umi no koto o yoku shiri. Die äh, kühlen ja auch die Erde und alles, das ist ja nicht so heiß ist. Und sie schlucken auch die Treibhausgase weg. There's a lot we need to discover about the ocean, and when we do, we can innovate new ideas to put more use to the ocean while protecting it. Memahami ekosistem lautan sangat penting bagi kita untuk menjaga bumi kita. So please join us in learning about the ocean and turning this knowledge into action that will help everybody keep our ocean healthy and safe for our generation and all those to follow. Okay. 
All right. So um, as you can see, different kids and different people from around the world have different perspectives, but they all value the ocean. And I think we all do in our own ways. Uh, for me, the ocean has always been my happy place. This is me when I was three years old and just um, being in the place that I love most on the beach in, in Denmark at the time. And um, it's always been like that for me. And I think a lot of kids and a lot of people have that reaction even as adults when they come to the sea they take a deep breath and they feel they've arrived somewhere um now as much as i was interested in in the ocean i was reading about marine animals and marine science even at a young age uh, school was not so much my happy place particularly i was not very good at math and so um at one point actually um, I would, there was a question whether I would make uh, the grades on my school so I could stay on that school. But fortunately, uh, uh, people looked out for me and I was able to pull through and I was able to um, go on and, and study nature and look deeply into nature. I came to Canada when I was about 20 years old and I had the incredibly fortune to be part of a study on um, killer whales or orcas in Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And I completely fell in love again with the ocean and its animals, and it became my lifelong passion. And then I did learn a lot more about ocean science, and it's important to understand not just to feel the ocean, but also to understand how it is working and how it is changing and how that may affect us and what we can do to have a, a better relationship to the ocean, to not pollute it as much, to not stress it through climate change or taking too much um, fish out of it. So I was learning about that for a few years, and I really started to see some of the problems we have. For example, I studied sharks for a number of years, still do, and um, sharks are some of the oldest species in the ocean. They're older than, quite a bit older than dinosaurs, but they haven't gone extinct like the dinosaurs. They're still with us. But some of those sharks, um, like for example, the huge plankton eating basking shark we have here in Canada, are at very low numbers because, for example, they get entangled in, in fishing nets and they get even um, run over by boats and they get um, killed, although we don't want to kill them. So um, seeing those problems made me really think about what are some of the solutions and how can we make things better? For example, through protected areas. So this is something I've been working on and I don't know how aware you are, whether you could name a marine protected area we have here in Canada. Maybe you can think for a minute for yourself. Um, do I know about these areas? Have I visited one of them? Maybe. Um, so uh, there's a number of them on all three coasts and also in the Great Lakes. Um, we have a number of uh, protected areas um, called National Marine Conservation Areas. And I really encourage you to visit some of them because they're places of great abundance where you can see species that you otherwise have a hard time seeing. So in this graphic, you see a little bit the difference between an unprotected area that is still um, exploited and a protected area that is now um, free from any pressure of exploitation where species can um, aggregate and they can uh, reproduce freely and they can um, increase in abundance in a way we don't very much see anymore. And so this is really the hope that we can use marine protected areas as to jumpstart the recovery of the ocean from um, some of the problems we've had in the past. And the really good news here is, is that not just Canada, but the world has really um, increased the number of marine protected areas we have. Um, when you go back 50 years, um, to the 1960s, actually 60 years by now, and you look at the growth of protected areas, you see the years clicking along here on the upper left, 1970 now, you see very few protected areas. Then a few are coming in, particularly in the Arctic in the 70s, but still few and far between in the 1980s and then now the 1990s, you see this is gaining momentum and we see these areas coming up all the time in the 2000s and specifically since 2010 look at this the explosive growth of large protected areas all over the ocean currently protecting about uh, seven or eight percent of the ocean um, in a meaningful way now in canada we're actually doing a little better than that 
we already have about 14% protected. And that's really good. And the government has just committed to doubling that again to more than doubling it to 30% by the year 2030. So this is really encouraging that we're starting to take care of our oceans in a way we haven't in the past. And you all can be part of this. Something else we're doing is we're not just protecting places that need recovery, we're also restoring, so actively rebuilding some of the habitats and ecosystems that are important. So here, for example, you see somebody in Washington state replanting an oyster reef. Now, oyster reefs, they're, of course, producing oysters, which some people like to eat, they're tasty, um, but also they filter huge amounts of water. They filter about six to 10 buckets of water an hour. So they're a natural filter to, um, to the water and they uh, maintain good water quality. They also build these reefs that are habitat for a lot of different species and they protect our coastlines from storms, for example. So they have all these different functions and people are understanding that when they are lost, um, we also suffer. So we're rebuilding these habitats. In the tropics, we have a similar um, habitat called mangrove forests. So these grow in the ocean. They're actually trees that grow in the ocean and they form these coastal forests that are again, important habitat for, for fish and shrimp and other creatures we like, but also um, they are important storm buffers, for example, against tsunamis. Um, these large rogue waves that can wipe out entire coastlines and mangroves have been shown to be an effective defense against those events. And then finally, coral reefs. You all know about coral reefs. We actually have corals right here in Canada, but they're deep water corals um, growing, um, for example, off the coast of Nova Scotia, but quite at depth, so it's hard to see them. But people are very familiar with the coral reefs that grow in shallow waters, for example, in the Caribbean and all over the tropics, but they have been suffering from the effects of climate change, for example, which uh, makes them bleach, lose their color, and then they die. So people have also actively been replanting coral reefs, um, growing them on these uh, clothesline-like structures until they're big enough to be cemented into the reef and hopefully regrow there and, and repopulate the reef. So people have been quite busy doing these various things. And again, since 1960s, we see um, a growth in these restoration projects, much like we do for protected areas. But as you can see, um, uh, first, this happened mostly in the US and a little bit in Europe. And then in the 1980s and 90s, people really started to work on this in Asia. You see all these mangrove replanting projects in Southeast Asia, in Australia. And um, again, since 2000, this has really accelerated and we see thousands of these projects all around the world. And again, this is something that everyday people like you and I can take part in and can contribute and can help with um, to make the ocean healthier. So I wanna turn it over to you and ask you, how do you see the ocean? What is your connection to the ocean? Maybe you wanna think for a minute about something like an experience you may have had um, with one of our amazing three oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific, or the Arctic Ocean, or a fourth ocean, the big inland sea of the Great Lakes, where I know some of you live. Uh, what's your experience uh, being out there in the summer and maybe observing animals or swimming, diving, whatever you might do? Um, what's your connection to the ocean? Yeah. Well, if anyone of our folks on YouTube wants to chime in there, great. I'm going to head to Mr. Atkinson's class in a second. But two things that jump out to me on the East Coast, you started with this beautiful whale photo. And I had the chance to kayak off the East Coast of Newfoundland and see mm -hmm. the whale there. And that was, I mean, it was one, the most incredible animal interaction of my entire life. I, you know, my jaw was on the on the hull of the boat the entire time. And every day I, I'm now in St. Catharines, Ontario, where I'm a 10 minute walk from Lake Ontario. And it's a place that even when I lived in Toronto, I lived in the north end of the city. So I'd go occasionally, but now that it's right here and it's so close, I go every single day to the lake. Like there's not a day that goes by that I'm not on the water in some fashion. And it really, it adds so much to my day. Yesterday we had uh, Dr. Melissa Lem talking about nature as medicine and this idea of the, the mental and physical benefits of it. And it's, it's night and day. It feels so great to have that opportunity. So that's my experience with it. And Mr. Atkinson's class, if you guys have a, a thought, come on in. 
Hi. Uh, Hi. My question for you is, is there any scientific research that indicates migration through underwater animals from our pollution? And if so, because of this migration, is that affecting the surrounding ecosystems since that can have a chain reaction from the food chain? And is this a big problem? What an wow. interesting question. <laughs> That's an amazing question. Uh, really, really insightful. And um, so you're asking whether we see migration because of pollution that, that uh, animals migrate away from the places they would like to live in because of pollution. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, uh, that was it. Yeah. So um, animals migrate for a bunch of reasons, and we do see changes in migration patterns. I think pollution has less of a role. The main reason why animals change their migration now is actually climate change. And the right whale I showed you at the beginning uh, and that I saw sections of in the Bay of Fundy um, is the best example of that here in Canada. So right whales, um, there's only 350 of them left in the world. Um, the northern right whale that is that we have here in Canada. There's more in the southern hemisphere, different species. And they um, used to come into the Bay of Fundy where I saw them. Um, for centuries and people were very aware of where they were and so it was easier to protect them because people knew exactly where they would come in the summer and they would hang out in the same spots and they would feed on the same things and then climate change happened and um, the species didn't find its food source anymore where they used to be and so they came into the Bay of Fundy they looked for their food they didn't find it and they kept going and they kept going up north and up north is a very busy shipping area in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It's also a very heavy fishing area. And the species uh, were, were having problems there by being hit by sh large ships going in and out, the Great Lakes actually, and also by uh, entangling themselves in fishing gear. And unfortunately, a number of them died that way. And that was a, a good example of where species had to change its migration pattern because of climate change. And we had to catch up with that to protect it in its new habitat where it lived in the warmer climate. So, uh, but great question. And I'm not aware of any effect of pollution other than climate change uh, changing the migration pattern, but it's, it's co completely conceivable that that might happen. Um, one example I can think of is um, comes to mind now is plastic pollution, which of course we're all concerned of, and we can all play a part in avoiding plastic pollution by recycling all the plastic we use. And there are some beaches in the tropics that are so covered with plastics that sea turtles don't come there anymore to nest because they literally can't find their way through the plastic. Now, the good news is that people have started cleaning up these areas. For example, in India, there's a beach that had, if you can believe that, one or two foot of garbage um, on the beach. So you couldn't even see the sand anymore. People cleaned this up just on their own volition, and the sea turtles came back, and they're nesting there again, and they're doing their thing. So we can reverse some of these things as well. Great question, though. Fantastic, guys. Uh, Boris, if you want to continue on with the, the, I guess, the query of how do you see the ocean and, and keep going with the slide? Yeah, sure. So um, I wanted to do a quick quiz with you guys. Mm -hmm. So you have something to do, right? Rather, rather, just, uh, rather than just listening. So, um, and I call this the Blue Planet quiz. There's just three questions. I want to ask you, what is the average depth of the ocean? So, of course, there's very deep trenches and there's shallow areas. But if you would level all of that out and distribute all the water over the same depth, how deep would the ocean be on average? Would it be 750 meters, 1,500 meters, or 3,000 meters? Ooh. So maybe in your class, you can, so raise your hands. Who thinks uh, 750? Raise your hands. What do we think in Mr. Atkinson's class? 750? How many hands? Okay, I don't know. How many think 750? Okay. <laughs> How many? No hands. No hands. How about, how about no 1,500? Um, 1,500. Okay, and how about 3,000? <laughs> okay, so the correct answer is 3,000 meters. This is how deep the ocean is on average. 
Um, of course, we could never dive down there without a submarine. The pressure is too high. It would crush us instantly. But some animals can dive that deep. For example, the bottlenose whales we have here of Nova Scotia, they're the deepest diving whale. and They dive down to 3,000 meters to find their food. But that's the average depth of the ocean. So there's a lot of water there. Here's another question. Um, now, the ocean is filled with salt water, of course. Um, it's not just the salt we use in cooking, it's all kind of minerals as well. And the amazing thing is that the water in our body, in our, in our tears, in our blood, for example, um, is salt water of the same mineral composition as the ocean to a T. And that tells you that once we came from the ocean, or you could say the ocean still lives within us in the fluids we have in our bodies. So um, what percent of your body is actually ocean water or salt water? Is it 40%? Is it 50% or is it 60%? So who says 40? Raise your hands. Mm, and this morning stars class is joining us on uh, YouTube as well. So if you guys want to chime in, please feel free. What are we thinking, Barry? Uh, three. Three, three out of 25. Three out of 25. <laughs> okay, 50%? How, how many 50%? Two. Uh, three out of no, four or five, five out of 25. So most, most are C then, just like our class on YouTube. So most people think 60% for us. What are we, what's the- And you 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 guys know more than, than most people I talk to because most people get this answer wrong. It is in fact 60%. 60% of your body is salt water. 70% of our planet's surface is salt water. Coincidence? Probably. But still, these are some key facts to know about the ocean, both the ocean that surrounds us and the ocean that you carry inside of you. Now, the third and last question. Most species on Earth live in the ocean. Is this true or is it false or is it we don't know the answer to this? Who thinks this is true? I don't know. Do we think it's true? Seven, eight, nine, ten. A lot of them think it's true. Half true, okay. False. Okay. Majority. Okay, majority think majority. it's true. Okay. I think C. The actual answer is we don't know. And isn't this crazy um, that with all the science we have done and all the expeditions we have done, we can't answer that question. The reason for that is that the deep sea, which may hold a lot of species, we have only explored very, very, very little of. So we haven't had the means to go down there and really look um, for the kinds of species that are there. For the species we do know right now, um, about 10 times as many species live on land than in the ocean. But a major reason for that is that we've just spent so much more time on land because we live there that we have uh, gotten a lot further cataloging those species. Also, most of these species are insects. So we don't have insects in the ocean or just uh, two or three species. So um, that may have something to do with it, but also there's all these species in the oceans that we haven't explored yet. Even large species like whales, like sharks, we're still finding new species every single year of whales and sharks in the ocean. Most people don't know this. They think we found all of these, but the answer is we haven't. So um, to me, that's an amazing fact about our planet that we don't know this. So, in order to change all that and to change our knowledge about the ocean, I started this project called Ocean School. And I want to tell you a little story of how I got inspired to do this. Um, I was traveling in Indonesia in 2010, and I was visiting this region that's incredibly beautiful called Raja Ampat in West Papua. And I uh, ran into this very colorful vessel that went from village to village. And it was a floating ocean school. It was a bunch of teachers, including one from Canada, that were going from place to place to really engage people and teach them about the incredible ocean that, that surrounded them. Of course, people there already know a lot about the ocean, but they didn't know, for example, that their ocean is the most species rich on the planet. There's nowhere on Earth that has more species, known species that is, um, of ocean creatures than this region. And it gave people a great sense of pride. And I thought, why don't we do this in Canada? So we did some surveys here in Canada, and it became very clear that ocean literacy or our awareness of the ocean um, is 
quite low. Um, and when we did surveys, even here in Nova Scotia, where we're surrounded by ocean, and we asked students about their ocean knowledge, a lot of them had, didn't have answers. And I will say, you guys did better today than the average uh, in those surveys. So for over the last five years, we've been producing content, traveling all over the world, um, having um, young youth hosts with us that, that would explore with us and, and, and discover the ocean through submarines, through walking, <laughs> through swimming, through diving. We're working with scientists, for example, from the Department of Fisheries quite a bit. We're using new technologies like this underwater drone um, to dive to the deepest uh, areas of the ocean and find those species that haven't been described yet. And we have created these immersive and interactive experiences, um, for example, through virtual reality and augmented reality. And here's the, um, the encounter I told you about at the beginning of when I was able to dive with right whales in the Bay of Fundy, something you can experience for yourself uh, through VR and 360 video in, in our Ocean School resource. Um, we launched a, a platform that anyone with an internet connection can, um, can access for free all around the world. It's in French, English, and some of it is in Spanish as well. And uh, we've been, we keep doing these expeditions. Like I went back to Indonesia, for example, where I found that original Ocean School and tried to document how that place is changing and, and why it is uh, doing so well these days. And it's largely because people were very diligent about protecting the ocean after learning about it. Um, I want to close by showing you um, our newest trailer. Um, and this was a bit of a different um, experience for us. We went to Western Canada and we worked with a First Nation called the Halsak First Nation in British Columbia uh, to really learn about the way they see the ocean and they use the ocean and they value the ocean and what we can learn from that Aboriginal um, Indigenous perspective. And we had a youth host from there called Jordan. And here's Jordan telling you about his place. The sea and the land feed one another in a forever cycle. This is rainforest country, Canada's Pacific Northwest, and home to the Heysalk Nation. My people have been stewards of this land and these waters for over 14,000 years. That's over 700 generations of Helsic people. Our mission is to explore the central coast of British Columbia and the cycles that connect land and sea. This rich ecosystem here depends on keystone species like herring and salmon that are important for the overall system to thrive. The healthy people and all of us depend on this vibrant environment in many different ways. Yes, the highest catch yet. Unfortunately, the harvest of both of these species and many others has been declining. Everything we do on land ultimately is going to end up in the water. Without those resources, a lot of the, the life as we know it today will be gone. We'll count salmon as they battle to return to the place of their birth. If it was a bear, more of it would be eaten. And if it was a wolf, the brain would be probably missing. We'll spot herring eggs from a seaplane, then take to the water and reel them in by the millions. And we'll dive deep into my people's balanced relationship with the natural world. One of the most important aspects is to learn to incorporate multiple perspectives into understanding how this place has been changing and how we can do a better job in managing it. We can talk about biomass levels, but that information in isolation isn't enough. Whether animals, humans, we all have a role in the balance of an ecosystem like this. It's really a, a merger of the local age of knowledge and the actual science. We're natural scientists. Learning these lessons of the past will be critical in leading us all towards a more sustainable future. Everything that I learned is not for me, it's to pass on to the next generation. It's rooted in our DNA, it runs through our blood. It's who we are. So I want to 
want to bring it back to you guys and just to make this point that um, you will shape the future of our ocean and our world and this world really needs you and it needs you to be engaged with the ocean and with our natural environment and with each other in order to make that change so thank you for the opportunity um, to to talk to you this morning and uh, we can have some questions fantastic uh, Boris, what an amazing presentation. I always love when we can bring it back to Canada. I know when I was a boy, uh, about the age of all our classes today, when I thought about nature, when I thought about wildlife, I always thought about places like Indonesia, like East Africa, Australia. And increasingly, I, I found Canadians are really coming to realize the, the really special array of habitats and ecosystems that we can find really close to home, both in Ontario for some of our folks today and, and certainly on our coast with some really, really special ocean wildlife. We've got um, Jill Heiner, like the world's top diver on this broadcast, and she's been all over the place. She dove inside icebergs and she says off the west coast of BC is her favorite place to dive in the world because of that. Yeah. In fact, this is where I learned diving. So I came here from, from, from Germany and I had done a lot of diving in a pool, but I've never been diving out, out in the ocean. And I learned it at the north end of Vancouver Island and I had the same reaction. I was, this is like a fairy tale. Yeah. And it, it, it sure is. And again, people, divers in British Columbia have been very diligent about helping to protect some of these places. And, uh, and that's a really good thing. It's fantastic. I, I do encourage our, in fact, our classes today, you guys are old enough to start on the path to become a scuba diver. You can have one of those pictures where there's a whale right beside you. It's, <laughs> it's, it's black magic to be able to breathe underwater. And I, I got my own certification a couple of years ago and I've never looked back. It's just such an amazing experience. So I hope you all get that chance. Um, Mr. Atkinson's class, I'll come to you guys live in a second. You can percolate with those questions. Your first one was great. Miss Morningstar joining us in Niagara. Uh, their class wants to know, do you think we'll ever know all the species in the ocean? I love that question. Oh, I sure, I sure hope so. I mean, this is what we're, what we're trying to do. You know, I, I sometimes think about um, aliens coming to this planet and talking to us about our planet. And they say, you know, what's so special about your planet? And I would say, well, our planet has water on it, which a lot of planets don't and that water has a lot of life in it. And then they would say, how much life? And we would say, we don't know. And I think that's embarrassing. So yes, we, we are working to, um, to change that. And there's new techniques um, that really accelerate that. Um, four years ago, I sailed, uh, well, I was part of an expedition that sailed right around Canada, all three oceans, from Toronto to Nova Scotia, to the Arctic, and all the way around back to Victoria, BC. And they were taking water samples every day and they analyzed the DNA in those water samples. And from that, they could tell which kind of species live in those waters and maybe DNA they haven't seen before and species they hadn't seen before. So it's a new way of describing what is there in terms of species and biodiversity, as we call it, and, um, and, and where we're still missing um, the, the species in, in our picture. Great question. Though. You're you're doing a fantastic job of making the the life of a scientist seem very romantic. I must say. Um, again, I always like to highlight the kids. You know, when they they think about what it takes to become a scientist. In fact, I'll ask that question next. Uh, when you left school, how long? How much additional education did you need to end up in the position where you are today? Mm -hmm. So. Um... When I left school, I first worked in ambulance service for two years, so I went for a completely different direction. Um, and then I came to British Columbia and I was part of this story, uh, this, this study rather, um, uh, studying the killer whales. And um, after that, I went to university for four years and I learned about the ocean, as I said in my slides. And I really appreciated at the end of that time when I started to ask my own question and I was able to do experiments and, and science by myself. That's when I really caught fire and I thought, oh, that's what it's supposed to be like. It's not like school at all, actually, because you're, you're working on things that nobody has ever worked on. So you're trying to answer questions for which there is no answer in no textbook in, in the world. There's an answer to these questions. So you're trying to find out for yourselves and you're asking questions for yourself. And that's what I found really. And that's after about four or five years. And yeah, and then you just keep going. And, um, and it's, a, it's a lifelong journey of learning. And I'm still learning every day things that I don't know. Um, you're never finished with learning. And to me, that's fascinating. That's a beautiful answer. I've always loved the idea of undergraduate master's degrees as being this time where you sort of 
get all the world's knowledge. You try and understand as much as you could possibly learn. And when you're doing your doctorate, it's to contribute to that knowledge. And I think that most scientists really value that opportunity to both have adventures and then collaborate with colleagues around the world on a global scale. It's a really universal thing that, that scientists get to do, which is really, really nice. Um, or as Mr. Atkinson's class, they pressed a button, they're back in the broadcast now, so I'll bring him in for a question. Hi, guys. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you have a question for us, come on up, guys. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hello. Oh. Are you all good for a question? Okay. I'm just wondering Hello. if they're trying to. Oh, they're having some tech difficulties of some kind. That's okay. That's half the fun. There has to be something going a little wrong in a video. That's <laughs> How do you know? You're in one. Um, Miss Morningstar's class, uh, I guess a nice follow-up on the first question. How many species are in the ocean? Like, what is the tally that we know yeah. or don't? Or, yeah. Fantastic question. So there's about a quarter of a million species. So about 250,000 species we know in the ocean. Um, uh, and you might ask, what are they? Uh, over 100,000 of them, for example, are mollusks. Um, so species, we don't think about that much. So these are snails, mussels, uh, octop octopus, species like that, um, squid, um, that, are, that are particularly species rich. Um, we have about um, 17,000 or so known fish species in the ocean, but there's probably a lot more that we're discovering. When we went back to Indonesia, uh, we actually discovered a few new species right there in that tiny, teeny fish that are about the, the size of my thumbnail, uh, some of the smallest vertebrates on the planet. And they live in little crevices in the reef. And um, they're incredibly beautiful when you look at them close. But when you don't know they're there and you're not looking for them, you may as well overlook them because they're so tiny. So they're essentially like insects on land, but they're not insects at all. They're vertebrates, they're fish, but they, they are as abundant and as diverse as in insects in the ocean. Like it, it's just so cool. I mean, I'm a biologist by background and I live and breathe this stuff. Steve Irwin and David Attenborough are my heroes. So anytime I get the chance to hear about this, it's very exciting, but it's just, it, it's such a magical, unique world. I really do think for our classes, like if you, if you don't know how to swim or scuba dive or do all these things, 70% of the world is, is water. And so you're, you're cutting yourself off from over two thirds of the Earth's surface where there's all these amazing places to visit and see and explore. And I, I really do encourage all our classes to get that chance and, and get out in the water in, in some fashion. And um, actually, if, if, you are, if you are studying biology and you're, you're, you're getting a little bit of knowledge of what is there already, you're getting much better at seeing those things that we haven't discovered yet. And I give you an example just from my backyard. I have a colleague here at Dalhousie University, a graduate student, her name is Jana Eklid, and she went for a nature hike um, out in a lake area, and she was threading through some mud, and she took a sample of that mud and brought it home to the microscope just out of curiosity. And she found what's not just a new species, but a whole new branch of the tree of life, a new phylum that was not known no. uh, to science, in uh, basically on the mud, in the mud on her boots. So you know, if if that if that's happening, there could be new species right in your backyard that you don't know about, not just in the ocean, but also on land. See, this is uh, the you know what we're going to have you back on in May to say that exact story when we're doing our backyard bio, where we're getting kids out and exploring their backyards and then getting sure. to. Oh man, what a cool thing! Um, Mr. Atkinson, I know you guys are having some tech difficulties. If you did want to share in the chat, please feel free to. Um, while we're oh, we might be in. Let's see. We are back. Hey, I, and Barry. Device. Yes, we have one question. If uh, that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Please. All right. Go ahead. How do you deal with invasive species interfering with marine safe zones? Nice. Oh yeah, that's a very very good question. Uh, you guys are really thoughtful. I will say that um, because it's a question that we're very uh, concerned about. I give you an example, and this is the Caribbean. Um, some of you might have been to the Caribbean. It's beautiful. It's clear water. You have coral reefs, um, but those reefs are struggling. So people are really trying to protect them, and they're doing a decent job at protecting some of those places, and some of them are recovering. Now, then enter the lionfish. The lionfish is an introduced species coming from the Indo-Pacific. It's beautiful. It's a striped fish. You could look it up online, and um, it has these, these big fins that flares out to scare other fish. 
And then it scares these other fish and corners them. And then it has this huge mouth and it sucks them in and eats them. And they're just so good at eating reef fish. And the reef fish don't know what to do with them because they've never seen anything like it. And they've wiped out a lot of reef fish in the Caribbean and they're spreading very fast. So what are people doing to protect the reef fish from this invasive species? Um, one thing they do is scuba divers go out and they try to find them and harpoon them. They can actually be eaten. So there's almost like a fishery for them now. Um, but a lot of them live deeper where you can't scuba dive. So it's very hard to find them. And what we've learned is that when you get these invasive species, it's like the it's like COVID-19. You can fight it when it's still um, very local and when it's uh, newly arriving. You can fight and 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 uh, subdue that uh, uh, invasive species or this disease. But once it's run out of control, it's very hard to rein it back. And we see that with the COVID-19 vi virus as well. So it's the same with inv invasive species. And unfortunately, protected areas are not safe from that because you can't fence these areas in, right? It's in the ocean, everything's connected and everything gets everywhere. So the same with plastic pollution and, and same with climate change. Um, it does affect protected areas in a very similar way as unprotected areas. I will say, though, that oftentimes protected areas, because they have a greater diversity of species, they're better able to deal with some of these threats, particularly climate change. But invasive species can be a real problem, and that's a really good question. Yeah, I'm really glad we got that one, and we don't usually get folks uh, keen on that. So uh, I guess the, the ultimate final question, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, and so I want to wrap up with the idea of what can the kids in these classes today do? So both our classes today, they're not landlocked. They are on bodies of water, but they're nowhere near the ocean. So no matter where you're joining from across the continent, around the world, what can you do as a, as a youth or a classroom to protect uh, ocean ecosystems? Well, uh, you heard um, this was uh, Dr. Reynolds saying in, in our last video from the House of Nation, he said, everything we do on land affects the ocean and everything we, we, we put into the environment ultimately ends up in the ocean. And this is very true because um, any river system in the end, it ends up in the ocean. The Great Lakes are all connected to the ocean. Um, so uh, for, with plastic pollution, for example, any plastic that gets into the environment will end up in the ocean ultimately. So this is something we can do in, in, in our lives is to control that and make sure all the plastic gets recycled. And we just also reduce our consumption of plastic where, where possible. Um, another uh, form of pollution that ends up in the ocean is carbon pollution from, um, from our, our tailpipes and from um, uh, our power plants and, and 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 any other fossil fuels we use, all of it affects the ocean. In fact, about 30% of all carbon that we emit ends up in the ocean and it actually acidifies the ocean. It turns it into an acid, which is uh, a danger to the animals living there. So um, any way we can reduce our impact, for example, by um, driving less or choosing an electric car or by... Um, just cranking down the heat, that heat a little bit in our home or switching off lights at night, all of that will help the ocean uh, in a very real way, not just kind of in some imaginary way, but in a very real way, because that carbon will not be um, emitted and it will not end up in the ocean. So these are just two ways. And then the third one I will say is spend as much time as you can by the ocean, learn about the ocean, have your own experiences, study the ocean in your own way, whatever that means to you, and if you want, um, make the ocean your career. There's a ton of ocean careers out there that people are not, not so aware of. It's not just marine biologists and, 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 uh, and divers and, and captains. There's a huge variety of uh, new jobs out in the ocean sector that you could go look for. And maybe you can spend your life on the ocean, with the ocean, and for the ocean. What a beautiful answer. I love that last little bit. And you know, it's quite fascinating to me having done over a thousand broadcasts working with conservationists of all kinds around the world. Uh, the answer to that question, whether it's oceans or ecosystems or whatever, always sums up to two things. Be educated and share what you find with others. So be passionate about things and connect with other people and don't waste as a principle, whether it's emissions, products, food, what have you, uh, those things really make a positive difference. And I, I really see in today's youth, you know, I think everyone assumed my generation would be the one taking the biggest action. And we sort of, we did okay. But the kids in these classes today, you guys march in, in groups of millions around the globe. You guys go on school strikes and, for, you know, because you know the science, you're so vested in this, you know so much. Uh, your questions were a testament to that today. So a huge thank you to our classrooms. And, and Boris, I want to encourage all our classes, you highlighted this at the beginning, 
oceanschool.ca, at oceanschool now. Amazing resources, truly one of the best things I've, I've ever seen in the education sphere, uh, a testament to your work. So I hope everyone gets the chance to check that out. And of course, this is the Nature for All Festival. So if we want people to check out more about all the amazing nature organizations in the globe, natureforall.global and particularly the Discovery Zone. Uh, as you know from your broadcast for this last year, we wrap up by bringing in our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. So Mr. Atkinson's group, Join me in saying thanks. And, uh, thank you so much.